The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in the sixth chapter and reading verses 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Those who meet here regularly will realize that we are still considering this great and important statement of the Apostle, and that in particular we are looking at this word about the wiles of the devil. The Apostle gives a very solemn warning to these Ephesians and through them to all other Christians to bear in mind always that they are confronted by the wiles of the devil. The story of the Christian is not just that he believes and is converted and saved and never has another problem. Alas, that isn't true. He wages a fight, he wrestles, and he wrestles not against flesh and blood, but he's confronted by all the malignity and all the wiliness and the subtlety of the devil and all the forces that he commands. And therefore the apostle warns them to be prepared for this in order that they may be enabled to stand. Now we are considering these wiles of the devil, and we've seen that they're almost endless in their variety. We are interested in the moment in the wiles of the devil as they're turned upon us in the realm of our experience. We consider them as they attack the mind, we shall look at them as they attack us in the realm of practice. But now, we're looking at it from the experimental standpoint. And uh, in particular, we have arrived at the point where we are considering how the devil tries to produce in us a general spirit of discouragement. We began with that theme last Sunday morning. We indicated the temperament, of course, and obviously comes into this and plays a very great part in it. But in addition, there is this tendency to introspection and to morbidity, which can be very paralyzing. And then we saw how we are sometimes made to worry about our lack of progress and development. And finally, we looked at that phrase, be not weary in well-doing. But still, we haven't finished with this matter of general discouragement. Another way in which the devil produces that general discouragement very frequently is through worry and anxiety. Now, here again, of course, is a very great subject. Temperament comes in once more. We've seen that the devil is an expert on our temperaments. He knows us, knows us much better than we know ourselves. And he uh, trims his particular temptation, his particular approach along the line of our temperament. And there are some who are naturally given to worry and to anxiety. They're that type of person. And the devil, knowing this, presses them along that very point. Uh, what he does, of course, he doesn't do it openly, but what he does is this. He knows that they're conscientious. He knows that they're sensitive people highly strung people, people who are never content to do a thing anyhow, somehow. They're perfectionists. They're never content with anything less than a kind of absolute perfection, which is a very good thing. But the devil comes and he presses that, so that it becomes a very grievous thing. And they end in this state and condition in which everything practically is a problem and everything becomes a burden. Now, the Bible's got a great deal to say about this. There is a great deal of warning in the Bible against what it calls the cares of this world. 
Clearly, it's something that has always afflicted God's people, this type in particular, the cares of this world. Or, if you like, you've got a classic example of this in the case of Martha. She is the great type and example of this tendency to worry and to anxiety. Our Lord turned to her and said, Martha, thou art troubled about many things. And it means distracted, torn hither and thither, so that she scarcely knew what she was doing. Now, that's the type of thing that we are looking at at the moment. It means that the mind is filled and uh, preoccupied with the uh, things uh, pertaining to life. Now, they're perfectly legitimate things. It's very important we should remember that. We've already considered evil thoughts and imaginations and distractions along that line. We are not considering that now. We are considering people who have got a concern about things that are not only legitimate, but things which, uh, generally speaking, are essential to life. This may be, well, the particular problem of the housewife, the mother in the home, who's got a husband and children to look after and to care for. These things are right and legitimate. But what the devil does is so to fill the mind and the consciousness with these cares, these legitimate matters, that they not only become a burden, but they crowd out spiritual thoughts. They crowd out spiritual realities. And though we are dealing with a Christian person, the main outlook in life and the main tenor of the life almost ceases to be a spiritual one at all. And the time is given exclusively to these problems and affairs. Well, it's obvious uh, how the devil uh, would clearly make great use of this uh, particular tendency in certain persons. If he can keep our minds from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ, if he can keep us from thinking about the soul and about our growth and development, obviously, he is more than satisfied. And that is what he does with this type of person. And that is why, you see, our Lord himself more than once paid great attention to this particular matter. You remember how in the parable of the sir he does that. The danger is not merely that the devil comes and takes the word immediately. No, no. He says there's another type of person. And the whole trouble with this kind of person is that the devil just brings in the cares and the affairs of this world, and the word is choked. That's the sort of thing that we have in mind. But there's a still more solemn warning. Here is our Lord giving his prophecy of the course of history and the end of the world. Here you'll find it in the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. But this is how he finishes. Verse 34, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. You've got to be careful. Same thing, you've got to watch the wiles of the devil. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. Well, you say, that's all right, we're Christian people. We needn't worry about uh, being overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. But wait a minute, not only with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. In other words, the Apostle Paul here, in the section that we are looking at, is just repeating and putting in his own way what our Lord and Saviour himself at the very end of his life under the shadow of the cross was so careful to teach to his followers. We've got to take care, we've got to pay great heed, lest the cares of this life render us unprepared for this momentous event which is coming. Well, now then. There is the kind of thing that we are dealing with. You're familiar with it. Worry and anxiety, problems, burdens, 
everything becomes a burden so that in the end the poor person becomes utterly distracted and scarcely able to control himself or herself. How do we meet this? This particular manifestation of the wiles of the devil. Well, the first thing, of course, still is to recognize the hand of the devil. That's all important. The trouble is, you see, that we tend to look at the problems, the circumstances, and the conditions, and we fail to see the hand behind them. Now, the whole secret of victory is to realize that it is the devil and not the circumstances. We must realize that it is he who is trying to get us into this paralyzed spiritual condition. We start with that realization. And then the next step is, of course, to reprimand ourselves. We must represent, re reprimand ourselves for many reasons. Here's one, and it's a sufficient one. A Christian person has never a right to be agitated. The Christian has no business to be in what we call a dither. That is just utterly wrong in a Christian on general principles. A Christian should never be out of control. That's one of the great differences between the Christian and the non-Christian. There's an element of discipline always in the life of the Christian. Uh, show me a man who's always losing his self-control. Well, then I say, if he is a Christian at all, he's a very poor one. He has no right to be like that. So we must reprimand ourselves. We say, what am I agitated like this? Why am I agitated like this? Doesn't my Christianity make any difference to me at all? You pull yourself up. You condemn yourself, you reprimand yourself. You say, I have no right to be like this. In other words, as I'm never tired of pointing out, we have to preach to ourselves. And we have to say, you've allowed the devil once more to trip you. You've been looking at the circumstances, you can't see that it's the devil who's crowding them in upon your mind in order to get you into this dither and into this paralytic condition. So you reprimand yourself for your failure, for your folly. And then the next step is the realization of the need of self-discipline. Now, I can only touch upon this great matter this morning, but here is the essence of self-discipline. The Christian of all people should always have a sense of proportion, but it doesn't come to us automatically. We have to do it quite deliberately. Now, that's, it's because we fail to do that the devil gets his opportunity. But the Christian is one who should always be reconsidering his or her whole position in life and in this world. And having done so, should always get certain priorities and always have a sense of proportion. I'm not sure that this isn't one of the best definitions of the Christian life. The difference between the non-Christian and the Christian is this, that the life of the non-Christian is being determined and manipulated by the world, whereas the Christian is a man who is in charge, he is in control. Now, here, there it was in that word we read just now, 2 Timothy 1.12. Here's the apostle, you see, in prison, and everything, as it were, going against him, gets his messages, discouraging messages from Timothy, if ever a man had a right to be overwhelmed and to lose his balance and his self-control, it was the Apostle Paul. He, but he says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. What he means is, I'm not put out. I'm not in a dither. I'm not making haste. I'm not upside down. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I don't lose my balance. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's it. Now that's, I say, a man who's in charge of life. He is disciplined. He's got self-discipline. He talks to himself. He keeps everything in proportion. Let me go back to the classic example of, of Martha. You see, our Lord puts it in that well-known phrase. Martha, he says, you are busy, troubled, distracted about many things. You're running back and forth from the kitchen to this room, and you're listening and going away, and you're back and forth, and you don't know where you are. You're in a flurry. You're excited. You've lost control of yourself. Mary, he says, has chosen that good part. It's a question of choice, Martha, says our Lord. It isn't that 
It's illegitimate to prepare a meal such as Martha was doing. She was concerned to entertain our Lord, and she feels it must be done. Everything of the best must be brought forward, and she needs the help of her sister. But here's her sister Mary sitting there and listening to the Lord. Why doesn't she help? So Martha was excited and troubled. Now said our Lord to Martha very gently, It's a question of priorities, Martha. It's a question of choice. Mary hath chosen that good part. One thing is needful. Put that at the beginning. Put that in the center. Make certain that that always has your priority. Then, if you've got that in the right place, let everything else fall into its right respective position. That's a sense of proportion. And, my dear friends, that's the whole secret at this point. But you've got to do this deliberately. It means discipline. Mary'd got it. Martha hadn't got it. Our Lord is telling Martha to, to discipline herself. And that's how she's got to do it. The good part. Keep the right things first. Keep them at the center. Ah, the family, the house, the home, the children, the husband, the work, the business, the profession, all these things are all right. They're very important. But they were never meant to be at the center of life. It's God. It's the Christ who's in the center. The soul. We are not primarily fathers or mothers or anything else. We are souls in the sight of God. Shall we put this perhaps in the form of that story about that tombstone? In a certain churchyard, I believe, there is a tombstone which is still to be seen. Here lies so-and-so, born a man, died a grocer. You see how important these things are. He's never meant to die as a grocer. He's meant to be a man. And we're all souls. And we're God's people. Priorities. Keep these things first. Then the devil will not have this opportunity. Or let's put it in the words of the Apostle Paul. In nothing be anxious, that's Philippians 4, 6 and 7, in nothing be anxious. You know, mustn't be worried about anything. You mustn't get into a dither about anything. It doesn't matter what it is, that word nothing is as all-inclusive as a word can be. In nothing be anxious, nothing at all, doesn't matter what it is. So it doesn't matter what your problem is this morning, however desperate, it doesn't matter. In nothing be anxious. Don't have anxious care. Don't get alarmed and excited. Don't get into a dither, whatever it may be. In nothing be anxious. But in all things, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Well, there it is. I wish we could stay with it. We must hurry on. The devil tries to get us into that state of worry and hyper-anxiety. And the answer is along the lines I've been trying to indicate. Now there's something closely related to this. And that is fear of the future. It's a subdivision, if you like, of the previous one. And yet, it does deserve a, a classification on its own. Because here, in addition to this natural tendency to anxiety and worry... Imagination comes in. It's a great thing to have an imagination, but it can be a burden and a problem. The people who lack imagination are fortunate in some respects, though they lose so much in other respects. But a lively imagination will be used by the devil and will go on into the future, the future which is quite unknown, and he'll conjure up possibilities. What's going to happen? What's going to take place? What suffering are we going to endure? And then the question, shall we be able to stand it? Will our faith hold? Will we be strong enough and so on? Well, no. Here again we've got the perfect example. And it is, of course, Timothy. Paul's disciple, Timothy. He is the biblical example of this whole mentality, which is naturally one given to fear and anxiety, but especially fear of the future. And, of course, Timothy had many good reasons for being afraid of the future. The great apostle is in prison. Rumors are circulating that he's about to be put to death. There are troubles in the churches. He, Timothy, is but a young man. 
What's going to happen? What future can there possibly be in such circumstances? Everything seems to be going. And here he is, fearful and filled with alarm as he looks at the future, losing his self-control, sending his frantic messages to the great apostle, wondering why God hasn't set the apostle free, why is God allowing this, and so on. All these things come in because he is looking to the future and he is afraid of the future. Now then, what do we say about this? How do we meet the wiles of the devil at this particular point? Well, the means and the method is very much the same. Except that I start with this very practical one, that apart from any other reason, this is an utter and a complete waste of time. To spend your time worrying about the future on grounds which are not Christian at all is a sheer and an utter waste of time. Because uh, the thing you're thinking about may never happen. You don't know. Don't cross your bridges until you arrive at them. That's common sense. That's the world, isn't it? But how often do we as Christians forget to apply that? It's a useless thing. It's a waste of energy. It's a sheer waste of time. And while you are worrying about the unknown future and the possibilities, you are failing to live and to function as you ought in the presence. It's a form of madness. Very well, recognize it. Condemn yourself for it once more. See that it's the hand of the devil. Do this same thing every time. Pull yourself up, address yourself, shake yourself, reprimand yourself. See what a fool you are to allow the devil to turn your mind and to work it up into a frenzy over mere possibilities and how you're paralyzed in the present. Very well, that's the first thing. But in addition to that, you can tell yourself that you're actually breaking a specific command of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Take no thought for the morrow. Now, by that, he means don't take anxious thought. It doesn't mean that you don't make provision and do what is necessary in life. He's talking about this worry and anxiety. What are we going to wear tomorrow? What are we going to eat? What's going to happen? And this and that. Don't do that, he says. You must never have anxious care about the morrow. Indeed, he says, take no thought for the morrow in that way. So that we see at once that we are breaking a very specific command and injunction of our blessed Lord himself. He says, you're behaving like the Gentiles. You see the contrast? What's the difference between a non-Christian and a Christian? Oh, it's this. The nations of the world, the Gentiles, the unbelievers, they spend all their time in thinking about the morrow. They're living only for this world, and that's their life, what you wear, what you eat, what you're going to do tomorrow, what's going to happen to you. The nations of the world, the Gentiles do that. He says, you are not like that. You mustn't be like that. You are children of your heavenly Father, and therefore you behave in an utterly different manner. So you take no thought for the morrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. But on top of that, let's remind ourselves that as Christians, we have received the Holy Spirit. You can't be a Christian without having the Spirit of God in you. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Holy Spirit is in every Christian. Very well, says the apostle to Timothy, you seem to have forgotten that. You are writing your letters to me, you're dependent upon me, and you're afraid of the future because you think I'm going to be killed. Timothy, says the apostle, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, which means discipline, self-control, orderliness. Timothy says... The apostle, you're denying the Holy Spirit that is in you. You're behaving as if you'd never received the Spirit. That's not the way a Christian behaves. You are, in a sense, denying your whole position as a Christian. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, endure thou hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say to Timothy in the second chapter, and that's the way we've got to speak to ourselves. But I want to go further. 
This uh, fearfulness with respect to the future is not only lack of faith, it's worse, it's unbelief. And let's pull it out and look at it and put the appropriate label on it and let's chastise ourselves. The whole art of defeating the wiles of the devil is to see that he's at the back of it all and having seen that, to look at yourself and to say, what a fool you are, to listen to him and to be taken in again. You address yourself and you condemn yourself. You say you're guilty of unbelief. How? Well, in this way. What about your heavenly Father in whom you claim to believe? You seem to be forgetting him. That's what our Lord says in his teaching there in Matthew 6. He says, your heavenly Father, know that ye have need of all these things. Well, very well, why are you worried? If you believe in him at all, if you believe in him as your Father, why not believe that he knows all your needs? Why not go on and remember that the very hairs of your head are all numbered? That no sparrow falls to the ground apart from your heavenly Father? How much greater value are ye than many sparrows? It's sheer unbelief, this. This is to be condemned root and branch. Why, my friend, don't you believe that all things work together for good to them that love God? Well, if you do believe it, why are you frightened? You've got to believe the promises of the Scripture. And if you don't, you're guilty of unbelief. That's ultimately the trouble with these people who are guilty in this way of this craven fear of the future. It is nothing but sheer unbelief. You're not trusting your father. You don't believe he's loved you with an everlasting love. You don't know that his care for you is infinitely beyond anything that you can ever imagine. That he so loved you that he sent his only begotten son to die for you. Very well. Round upon it all. And say in the words of John Newton, Begone unbelief, my Saviour is near, and for my relief will surely appear. Attack him in that way. Attack the devil. He's the source of this unbelief. And then by saying to him, His grace in times past forbids me to think. He'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. Show the unreasonableness of the thing. Turn with the divine logic of the scriptures to the devil and say, no, no, I'm not going to be afraid of the future. The God who has done what he's done for me already in his dear son is not going to abandon me. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Turn that logic upon him. Say, I'm not afraid of the future. The God who saved me in the past, the God who's with me now, is the God who always will be with me. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Very well. That's the way to attack this fear of the future that the devil in his wiles so often causes us to fall into. But let me go to another matter, which leads out of the two that I've already been dealing with. The whole problem of guidance. Now, here, I suppose, is one of the commonest of all. I've said that I know about many others. The fact is they're all common. And the devil repeats them. But take this question of guidance. Put in with it, if you like, answers to prayer. Put in it, if you like, the whole question of faith healing. They all belong to the same category. I think that if I were asked what is it that is troubling more Christian people than anything else just at this present moment, I would have to say it's this. There never has been greater interest perhaps in healing, guidance, answers to prayer. It's not surprising. The world is difficult at the moment. And any conscientious Christian person is anxious to do the right thing. And here seems to be a teaching which says, pray to God. That's all you've got to do. And you'll be told exactly what to do. You'll get your exact guidance. Or if you're ill, go to the Lord in prayer, and so on. Very well. Now then, let's see how this problem develops. Well, this is how the devil in his wiliness uses this matter. He uh, persuades us to take a mechanical view of it all. And what I mean by the mechanical view is this, that uh, it's really quite simple that there's no problem at all. You just go to God and you'll get your guidance. You pray to God and you'll get your answer. 
That's the whole meaning of prayer, surely. Is there any meaning in the word guidance if it isn't that? There it is. Simple, mechanical, direct. You get your... You get it, you expect it to happen always. You expect it to happen in detail always. Prayer of faith. What's it mean? Here it is, they say. And then with regard to healing the argument that it is never God's will that any of his children should be ill. How can a loving father allow any of his children to be ill? It is always God's will that we should be well and healthy. Therefore, if you're ill, obviously you just ask God, ask God to heal you. It must happen. Now that's the teaching. And the result of all this, of course, is this. That when these things don't happen, there is disappointment. You don't seem to be able to get your guidance. Or you thought you had had your guidance, but you found it was wrong. And here you are in trouble. You're disappointed. The healing hasn't taken place in spite of fervent believing prayer, as you thought. And all this, plus the fear of taking a wrong decision, depresses the believer begins to turn in upon himself and says, Am I a Christian at all? If I were a true Christian, surely God would have answered me. The thing would have happened, I'd know. Am I a Christian at all? Or if it isn't that, I'm lacking in faith. There's something wrong with me somewhere. I don't know what it is, but I'm lacking in faith somewhere. And the devil encourages you to believe that, and he may use your friends to believe that. I shall never forget an instance of a very godly and saintly woman who died in sheer spiritual misery. Why? Well, for this reason. The poor woman suddenly developed a growth in her throat, a cancer of the throat. And she and two of her great bosom friends began to pray about this, and they were great women of faith and of prayer. They were three great saints, and they believed she was going to be healed. They believed they'd been given that assurance, but she got worse and worse and worse. And then her two friends with the best intentions in the world began to suggest to her, was there some sin she was not confessing? Was there something she was hiding? They didn't know it, but there must be something. Or was she lacking in faith? Didn't she really believe what she said? And they reduced her to a state of utter misery. And as I say, she died in that condition. Now, there was no doubt that she died and went to glory. She was a great Christian woman, but she died in spiritual misery and was encouraged in that misery by the wrong teaching of her friends who had the best intentions and the greatest sympathy possible. And so you see the devil in his wiliness, he does all this, and then he comes and says, perhaps, yes, your faith's all right. It isn't you, it's that God isn't keeping his promise. You believed in a God of love. How can he be a God of love and leave you to suffer like this? How can he be a God of love and not let, not let you know what his will, in, will is? And so you see, the devil comes from every angle, and the poor soul is dejected and unhappy. The result is turmoil, confusion, unhappiness. And very often, their whole faith is shaken to the very depths. Now then, what is the answer to this? Well, obviously, it's not an easy matter. That's the first thing we've got to say. There wouldn't be all this trouble if it were a simple problem. It isn't. It's one of the most difficult problems in the Christian life. I'm simply going to put a number of suggestions to you for you to work out for yourselves. Here's the first. Obviously, this whole matter is not as simple as some of our friends would have us believe. No, that's the trouble always with the cults. The characteristic, the whole mark of a cult is that it always makes the thing quite simple. You do this, that happens. That's the characteristic always of a cult. And this teaching is often presented like that. They say there's no problem. You just go to God, you get your guidance. You pray to God, you're healed. You ask for God's will, he lets you know. It's as simple as that. Well, now, I say it is clearly not as simple as that. If it were as simple as that, there'd be no problem. There'd be no difficulty. And there would be no need for the teaching of the New Testament. There'd be no need for any preaching at all. Nothing could ever go wrong. But it isn't so. And I think I can tell you in the second place why it isn't so. 
And that is that if it were as simple as that, the Christian life would be machine-like, mechanical, automatic. It would be just like pulling a lever and the signal drops. But you know, the Christian life is not like that. That makes it into something almost magical. Not only that, if it were as simple as that, there'd never be any growth in the Christian life. You can't get growth and development in a machine. But where there's life, there's growth and development, and there is in the Christian life. And if it all happened automatically, you just make your request and get your answer, there'd be no room for growth. And there never is any growth in members of a cult. You meet them 20 years after they joined it, you'll find them exactly the same as they were at the beginning, if they're still in it. But there's certainly no growth. There's no room for growth. It all happens at once at the beginning, quite simply. And there's no room for growth. But here you have babes in Christ, young men, middle-aged, old men. There's ever growth and development and progress. But let me go further. I would indicate in the third place that there is specific biblical teaching with respect to this. The Apostle Paul did not get automatic guidance. The Apostle Paul was sometimes in difficulty about his guidance. Let me give you an example out of Acts 16. In the 16th chapter of Acts, this is what I read in verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Messia, they assayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now, the apostle thought quite clearly that he was to preach in Asia and in Bithynia. Here is this man of God, this great apostle. He believes this is what he's to do. The Holy Ghost has to prevent him and prohibit him specifically. And in the same way, he would never have gone to Troas. He would never have gone from Troas into Macedonia. Were it not that God had to intervene even in the form of a vision. The apostle was not clear in his guidance. And face to face with such an example, I say, we must never teach that guidance is certain, automatic, and infallible. It's not true. It's not true in apostolic experience. Neither has it been true in the history of the saints since then. You read their biographies, and you'll find that they've had great trouble on this question, and have often done things that were wrong. But they haven't lost their faith because of that, for the reason that they never believed in this automatic happening. And then, of course, we have the striking case of the apostle and his thorn in the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 12, three times he prayed to God with all faith and fervency that this be removed, but it wasn't removed. And he came to see why it wasn't. It was good for him. When I am weak, then am I strong. It brings him to the point of saying, thy grace is sufficient for me. Whatever the thorn in the flesh, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I'm content to go on. Let everything minister to thy glory and to thy praise. Trophimus has to be left sick. Timothy is told to take a little wine for his stomach. Now, these are sure facts in the teaching of the scripture. And as I say, the subsequent history of God's saints and people teaches exactly the same thing. There is nothing automatic about these matters in the teaching of the scripture, nor in the history of the church. But says somebody, what about James' teaching about the prayer of faith? Aren't you forgetting that? Well, let's have a look at it and see what it's got to say. Let me be perfectly fair in, in, these, in these matters. The epistle of James in the fifth chapter, you remember, deals with it and puts it like this. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, says so somebody, that's as plain as a thing can be. Why are you denying that and disputing it? My friend, the answer to you is this. If that again is as simple as you would have us believe, why doesn't it always happen? That's your problem. There are people who believe that as intensely as you are. Everything they're commanded has been done, but the sick has not been healed. 
There's your first question. That should make you see at once that there may be something wrong with your interpretation of the passage. But let me give you the parallel passage in Mark 11, reading verses 22 to 24. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now that's interpreted like this, as you know. People say, yes, you pray to God, you believe, and you don't even stop at asking God. You thank him already before you get up off your knees. You thank God for having heard your prayer of faith. You thank him for what you know for certain is going to happen. They say that's the prayer of faith. But again I say, facts are very stubborn things. And there are many unhappy and wretched Christians in the world this morning because they believe that kind of teaching wholeheartedly and honestly and sincerely, but the thing they desire does not happen. And they don't understand. Why not? Well, because they're misinterpreting the Scriptures. What is the prayer of faith? What is it that enables a man to believe that he's going to receive what he asks for? Now, that's the crucial question. And the answer seems to me to be perfectly clear. You can never bring yourself to that persuasion. The fact that you say that you believe it doesn't mean that it's true. You can't force yourself, you can't persuade yourself. Well, how does it happen, says someone? Well, I suggest to you that the prayer of faith is a prayer that is always given and indicted by the Holy Spirit himself. He gives it to you. And when he gives it, there is no doubt. There is no uncertainty. You're not working yourself up. You're not saying, I do believe. You're not... No, no. The Holy Spirit has made it absolutely certain to you. Let me use an illustration. Have you ever noticed in the book of the Acts of the Apostles two things about the healings worked by the Apostles? First, they never announced beforehand that they were going to heal. The faith healers do that. They say on Wednesday there will be a healing service in the afternoon. The apostles never did that. They never said beforehand that they were going to do it. Why not? I think I can tell you. They never knew when they were going to do it. They didn't believe it was a sort of permanent power that they had and all they had to do at any given moment was to press the button. No, no. This is what you find. Peter and John go up to the temple at the hour of prayer to pray. They see the lame man at the gate. He looks up expecting to receive alms of them. Then Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, What made him do it? I have no doubt of whatsoever in answering the question. He was given a commission. At that moment, the command came. The Spirit told him. Christ said, I'm going to do it through you. He knew. You find in the same way in Acts 14, Paul preaching at Lystra, there was an impotent man put to sit in front of him, and Paul, perceiving that he had faith to believe, spoke to him, a commission. Now then, in other words, I say in the first place, they never announced it beforehand because they never knew when it was going to happen. Secondly, when the apostles set out to heal, they never failed. Now, I'm talking about the book of the Acts of the Apostles, not about the Gospels, after Pentecost. They never tried and failed. Your modern healers try and fail very often because they're wrong in their whole teaching. They've never had the particular command. They've never had the particular commission. They believe this power is in the church. You've only got to exercise it. You claim the power. You act upon it. But there are more failures than successes, if there are any genuine successes at all. It's a misunderstanding. Now then, the meaning of the prayer of faith is this. It is a prayer that is given to you by the Spirit. You don't command it, I don't. You can never make yourself certain that you're going to receive what you're going to ask for. But God, through the Spirit, will at times give you that consciousness. That's it. Our Lord always had it. So he could remove mountains. There was nothing he couldn't do. He knew. 
There was this perfect accord, and he was ever doing his father's works. He says, the works that I do, I do not of myself, but the father that sent me, he doeth the works. And it is the same with us. It is only as we get into this condition that we are sensitive to the Spirit. We shall be given the authority. We shall be given the certainty. We shall be given the commission. And then there never will be a failure. But if we experiment and try to work ourselves up to it, there will be repeated failure and consequent dejection and disappointment and unhappiness. Very well. How do I summarize it? I put it like this. These things are the exceptions. God has his normal way of guidance and of healing and of all these other matters. And that is through means. We are meant to get our guidance through the scriptures, through an enlightened spiritual mind and understanding, through an enlightened reason, through an enlightened conscience. That's how normally God guides us. Thank God he does and he gives us certainty through these methods. You read your scriptures and their teaching, you apply it. If you're in trouble, go and consult another. Hence your pastors and teachers and older Christians. Bring it all together. Get the mind of the church, as it were, upon it. And then through circumstances, God will manipulate them and use them. And on top of it all, there is such a thing as a pressure upon the mind and upon the heart. Something you can't get rid of. You sometimes wish you could, but you can't. God is giving you some kind of general indication through a pressure on your mind that you're meant to do this and you can't get rid of the thought, well, these are the ways in which God normally guides his people. So that I would lay down as the ultimate rules of procedure something like this. Never make a claim in the presence of God. Don't claim healing. Don't claim guidance. You and I don't claim in the presence of God we come as humble, humble suppliants. Don't talk about claiming this or that. There's no such thing. That's the tragedy of this modern teaching and hence it's confusion. Don't talk about claiming. Well, what do you do then? Well, you commit yourself and all your affairs to God. Commit everything to God. Illness, future, guidance, everything. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Tell him that you have one desire is to know his will and to do it. Now, if you can't be honest at that point, you might as well stop. You start with yourself and you say, can I honestly say to God that I desire nothing but to know his will and to do that will, whatever it is? Whether I'm to go abroad or stay at home, whether I'm to be sick or whether I'm to be well, whether I'm to get married or not married, whatever it is, can I say honestly to God, Lord, my supreme desire is to know thy will and to do it. Whatever it is, tell him that if you can. And then having said that to God, remind yourself that he is your father. And therefore leave it with God. Don't you think too much about it after leaving it with God. It's his problem now, it's not yours. Don't pray to God and then get up and start thinking again and going wrong. You haven't believed in your prayer. Leave it with God. Tell him that honestly and leave it with him. Don't think too much about it now. But go on doing what you're meant to do. Do your work. Be observant. Keep your eyes open. Be ready at any, rip, at any point for some indication of God's will. Just be on the alert, but don't be anxious. Never be anxious. In nothing be anxious. Refuse worry, refuse anxiety. Leave it with God. Go on with your work. And finally, I would say this. Never act against that inner voice. In other words, you may find yourself as the result of doing what I've been saying that you've come to a point when everything seems to indicate that you should do that thing. But if there is a feeling within you that you shouldn't, don't do it. Always act as a whole. Never move until you're unanimous. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Read the end of Romans 14. If there's any doubt, he that doubteth 
is damned, says the apostle. He's wrong. If there's a, a doubt left inside you, which you can't even understand, something irrational almost, but it's very powerful, don't act against it, whatever your mind and reason, whatever everybody else may say. I uh, don't hesitate to teach this, that a man seeking guidance, a man trying to live God's will in this world is like a great train in a Paddington or Waterloo or somewhere. There it is. Everything's ready. And the passengers are all in. The steam is up. The train isn't moving. Why not? The signal hasn't dropped. And the train doesn't move, though everything is ready until that final signal is dropped. I am asserting that the final signal is this deep consciousness within. That's the last signal. Never act against it. Never act against your conscience. Never act against this inward sense. But if that is all right and agrees with all the rest, go straight ahead. But what guarantee says somebody have I now that I'm right? You've been shaking my confidence, my dear friend. What I'm telling you is this. If you do what I've just been saying, whatever the consequences, you will not suffer. You have acted as God's child should act. And God, knowing you and knowing your motives, will not punish you. He may prevent the thing you desire for your own good, and you'll thank him for it later on. But if you act scripturally, conscientiously, and according to these rules, you can do no more. And I do not hesitate to assert that God expects no more of you. You've submitted to his will, whatever it may be. And anybody who's in that position is to be blessed of God and will be blessed of God. Very well, I say, let us beware of the subtle teachings of the devil that are around and about us today in the cults and in other ways that would reduce all this great mystery of God's relationship to his children and our growth and development in grace to something mechanical and machine-like. Let us then as men quit ourselves as men and use the means that God has given us and if it be God's will for something unusual in our particular case, well, you can take it from me. He'll make it very plain and clear. There'll be no question about it. If it's the miraculous, there'll be the authority and the certainty that he gave his apostles, and he will give it to you. Well, may God enable us, one by one and together, to realize something of the wiles of the devil, that we may realize our need of the whole armor of God and the need of being strong in his might and in his almighty power. To that end, let us join in singing the hymn number 396. We'll omit the fifth verse. Hymn number 396, omitting verse 5. Begone and belief, my Savior is near.
We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.